All right, guys, we'll get started. So here's my uh, official formal introduction. My name is Rock Patel. I'm one of the orthopedic spine surgeons at the University of Michigan. Uh, my partner, Dr. Ilya Salim, is finishing up surgery, so he'll be here shortly if he can navigate the traffic. Um, I wanted to thank uh, Nicole and Nancy for helping set this up. Your feedback is going to be really important because we're starting this lecture series again. When I first started working here about a decade ago, we uh, started this lecture series and um, it kind of faded away. But our goal is to have um, once every quarter, maybe once every other month, uh, a lecture series on various orthopedic topics. So um, all of my partners do things ranging from total joint replacements to sports surgeries. Uh, we do spine surgery, obviously. So if we can give informative um, sessions on topics that affect kind of everybody, hopefully it'll be a, a good educational experience for people. Um, so your feedback is going to be really important. So um, what you want to see, what you liked, what you didn't like from this experience will help mold the rest of the series. So, so please let us know. Um, like I said earlier, the whole goal of this is just to be kind of an educational forum. Um, I know that when I'm in the doctor's office or uh, when I go with a family member to the doctor's office, even though I'm a physician, everything happens so fast. Um, you know, it feels like the 10 minutes goes by in one minute and you know, I don't have the opportunity to process everything that's asked, nor do I have the opportunity to ask the appropriate questions. And then I go home with a bunch of questions. Luckily, I'm a physician, so I can call my friends up and ask them what they meant when they told me certain things, but I understand that not everyone has that opportunity. So this is a laid back session. We're booked here until eight o'clock. We'll see as long as you guys want, uh, but feel free to ask any questions you have about what, what we're talking about. I picked a pretty broad topic, right? So the topic that I picked is lumbar stenosis. So um, I picked that because it's one of the most common ailments in the uh, in the lumbar spine. Uh, but really, when people have back have back pain, uh, it could be due to a whole host of things. And when I um, evaluate someone with uh, back pain or with any type of spine problem, the first question that I ask is, "Are you having back pain or are you having leg pain?" And usually, the answer is both, right? So then I ask patients to quantify in percentages what hurts more, your back or your leg, and give me a percentage. Is it 80-20, 50-50? Um, and the reason why that's important is different things cause back pain and different things cause leg pain. So when we're asking you these questions, we're not just trying to be annoying asking these pointed questions. We're trying to formulate a differential diagnosis in our mind to try to come up with reasons why you're hurting. The tricky part about spine as opposed to trauma or total joints or even any cardiac issues is the fact that if I get an MRI and everyone in this room, myself included, um, we would all have abnormal findings on an MRI. A disc which is bulging or herniated, um, some arthritis, some scoliosis, it's really common. And most people that have these findings don't have any clinical complaints, right? So my job is to play detective and to try to figure out which patients that have these abnormal findings um, have clinical complaints that match these findings. So if you say my left leg hurts and you have a herniation on the right side, that's not causing your pain. So me operating on it is not going to help, right? I have to figure out what's causing your left leg pain. Um, so basically my job is to tie your clinical complaints onto the MRI and then give you guys a, um, a big um, list of treatment options ranging from non-operative to operative. We always emphasize non-operative treatment first. The reason why non-operative treatment is important is because surgery is not 100% successful and it's associated with complications and risks, no matter how many times you've done it. Um, so my analogy is you can drive 55 miles per hour with your hands at 10 and 2, and you're still going to get a car crash if you drive enough miles. It's just a reality of it. So if you can avoid surgery, great. Uh, but if you need surgery, then that's what we're here for, okay? So anyway, I pick lumbar stenosis because it's a, it's a broad topic, and it's going to cover a lot of the, the questions that you'll have. Um, so in terms of what the agenda for this talk is, um, I wanted to talk to you guys about the anatomy of the spine. I think it's pretty important to understand the anatomy. Um, we doctors tend to speak in a different language. Uh, it's kind of like when I go to my accountant and he uses numbers and in, in terms that I don't understand, like a 403B. I have no idea what that means, but I need to go home and research it. So if we just go over the anatomy of the spine, I think it'll be useful for you guys to understand what happens when you go to your next doctor's visit. Then we'll talk about some of the main uh, pathologies we see in the lower back, stenosis being the one we'll talk about the most, and um, kind of how patients present clinically. And you can see if you're having some of these symptoms, maybe you have lumbar stenosis. Uh, we'll talk about what the treatment options are, once again, uh, non-operative and operative. And we'll talk about some new things that we do, because I know some of you may have had some lumbar procedures in the past. So just by show of hand, who has uh, lumbar back pain over here or leg pain? Anybody? 
Okay. And who's had previous um, injections? And who's had previous surgery? Okay. Cool. So we'll go through this and we'll, we'll just run through this agenda. Once again, this is super casual, okay? So if you have any questions, please stop me. I'm a New Yorker. I tend to speak fast, so slow me down and uh, just raise your hand, okay? Um, so once again, we're talking about lumbar stenosis because it's extremely common. So the incidence of lumbar stenosis is roughly 10%. That means one in, out of every 10 of your friends is going to have lumbar stenosis. And it's also the most common reason for spine surgery in the older demographic. Um, uh, what lumbar stenosis essentially means is narrowing of the spinal canal. Stenosis is just a general term for narrowing. So if you go to the doctor, now if you'll hear him say you have carotid stenosis, which means that the big blood vessel going to your brain is narrow. So stenosis is just a word for narrowing. And because of lumbar stenosis, um, there are more than 125,000 procedures uh, performed for this in 2003, and that number has grown significantly since 2003. And it costs a lot of money. It costs a lot of money to have the surgery. But it also costs a lot of money for patients because they suffer from this problem and they can't go to work and they can't do their daily activities. So it's a big financial impact as well. So in order to understand lumbar stenosis, it's important to understand the anatomy of the spine. So when we talk about the spine, we talk about the cervical spine, the thoracic spine, and the lumbar spine. The cervical spine refers to the neck. The thoracic spine is the middle of the back, and the lumbar spine is the lower back. And when we um, talk about these vertebrae, we label them C, T, and L. So uh, starting from the top, C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, C7. C7 is the last cervical vertebrae. And then there are 12 thoracic vertebrae, and there are five lumbar vertebrae. So the last one is um, L5, L4, L3, L2, and L1. Um, so that's the way we number them. So if someone says that they have a fracture at L1, that means that this vertebrae, this square, is broken. Uh, we also have discs which separate our vertebrae. All these spaces in the middle are discs. And you can view discs as um, the cartilage of your spine. So when you have arthritis of your knee, my mom just had her knee replacement, she had it because all the cartilage wore out between her femur and her tibia. So essentially she had no cushioning in between her, the bones of her leg and that was causing her pain, so she had a knee replacement. So when you have degenerative disc disease, what happens is the cushioning in between the vertebrae, these discs, they wear out and then you get back pain. Um, when we talk about a disc, we talk about which vertebrae it lies in between. So if this is L5 and this is L4, this is the L4, L5 disc. Does that make sense? All right, so that's the basic terminology of the spine. So at least now you have an idea of what we're talking about when we refer to certain vertebrae and the, the disc levels. Um, so once again, lumbar spine, L1 to L5, um, and your um, uh, thoracic spine and your cervical spine. So what happens when we get older? Um, myself included, I'm 45 now, and my x-ray doesn't look that great, and my MRI doesn't look that great. I think once you start reaching about 40 years old, you start seeing something happen, and this is called the degenerative uh, cascade. So your disc, which is a cushioning between the vertebrae, starts um, wearing out, and you could essentially view it as a tire which has gone flat. Um, the hydration and the fluid within the disc, which helps serve as a shock absorber, kind of dissipates, and you end up with a really flat disc and bone-on-bone -bone disease. When that happens, it puts a lot of stress on these, facet, on these facet joints, which are the joints in the back of the vertebrae. And when these facet joints and these ligamentum um, get stressed, they tend to react by forming bone spurs. So if you look at anyone's hands who has arthritis, you can see that the knuckles are swollen, right? Uh, and that's essentially bone spurs because of arthritis. So the same thing happens in the spine. The things that grow are the bone spurs off these joints, and this is called ligamentum flavum. It's a normal structure which stabilizes the spine. And this is your spinal cord. And these are the nerves that are exiting to the left and right sides. This is normal. What happens when the disc wears out and becomes flat is it puts a lot more stress on these facet joints on the bone and on the ligamentum. So it gets bigger and it enlarges. And as it enlarges, it compresses your spinal cord. So you can see how this looks like a circle and how this looks like a triangle. You can see how these nerves as they're exiting have room to exit. And over here, they're really pinched pretty badly, both on the left and right side. So this is, once again, called a degenerative cascade. And the main reasons why this happens is because the bone is growing, the ligamentum is growing, and the disc is wearing out. So it just squeezes the spinal cord from all sides. So the results of this is basically pain and numbness in the back and in the legs. So this is spinal stenosis. Uh, so once again, here's a picture of the narrowed spinal canal. 
the pinched nerve as it's exiting, and the thickened ligamentum. So when we talk about stenosis, you'll hear two terms thrown around, central stenosis and foraminal stenosis. So st central stenosis is when your spinal canal in the middle of your spinal canal is being compressed, and that causes um, certain symptoms of buttock and thigh pain. Uh, and then you have foraminal stenosis. So I don't know if you saw in the other picture, you can see you have your central canal, and then you have where the nerves are exiting, kind of like um, uh, uh, exits off of a highway. They exit off the left and the right side. Sometimes these exit ramps are a little bit narrow, and if they're narrow, it pinches the nerve as it's exiting. So the symptoms are different. The symptoms are particular to where that nerve goes. In our bodies, we're wired. So we have certain nerves that supply certain muscles. Uh, for example, L3 supplies your thigh. So if L3 gets cut, you can't straighten out your thigh. Um, and it causes pain on the top of the thigh. And you have each nerve supplying a different muscle. So essentially, if the nerves are compressed as they're exiting, you're going to have symptoms in that nerve distribution. So central stenosis squeezes the whole spinal cord and causes thigh pain. But foraminal stenosis, when the nerve is exiting the, the spinal canal, the exit ramp of the highway, if that nerve is compressed, you'll get pain in, in the leg based on whichever nerve distribution that's going to. So that's the difference between saying, Doc, when I walk, my back hurts and my buttock hurts and my leg hurts, versus saying, Doc, I have horrible sciatica going down one leg. That's the distinction that central stenosis and foraminal stenosis makes. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, great. Um, so what do we do when someone comes into the office? Well, well, the most important thing, once again, is to get your, your, your chief complaint and kind of understand what your symptoms are. Um, but once we talk to you, we want to look at some imaging studies, right? I know everyone uh, always says an MRI is better than a CAT scan is better than an X-ray. And that's just simply not true. They're just independent tests. They're just totally different. It's like comparing apples and oranges. So X-rays are great because they show bone really well. And also X-rays are taken in an upright position when you're standing up, right? So we can see what happens to your spine when, the, when your body weight is loading that spine. An MRI, on the other hand, is taken when you're laying down. So we can't see the effects of your weight on it. So if you have a scoliosis or if you have any instability, we're not going to see that on the MRI because you're laying down and everything goes back where it should be. But when you stand up, we can really see the impact of any instability that you have or scoliosis that you have. Um, but the X-ray shows bone. It doesn't show nerves or discs at all. And that's where an MRI is super helpful. An MRI shows your nerves really clearly, as well as your discs. So when we look at an MRI, we look at certain sequences in the MRI. The sequences are called T1 and T2. So basically, a T1 sequence shows fat. So if we're looking at an MRI up over here, you can see all that white stuff is fat. That's more fat than you should have in your spinal canal. If you can imagine an enclosed space and you just pump it full of fat, I know it's hard to imagine fat as something that's compressive, but that can squeeze your nerves tremendously. And we see, the, we see this a lot. It's called epidural lipomatosis. So essentially, it's fat squeezing the nerves causing spinal stenosis, narrowing of the canal. More commonly, what we see is spinal stenosis because of degenerative changes, like we described earlier with the disc wearing out. And that's what you see in this picture over here. This is a real life MRI, and it's pretty similar to the, to the cartoon that I just showed you a second ago, where you have these bones that are growing, and you have the ligament which is thickening, and the disc which is bulging, leading to a really narrow space for the spinal cord. So you can see how that dark circle is being compressed tremendously, and that's spinal stenosis. So that's why an MRI is useful. So when people have uh, spinal stenosis, they typically, um, have well no matter what no matter what's causing someone's pain there's typically a position which makes your pain better and uh, typically a position which makes your pain worse and it's important for us to ask what causes your pain to be better and what causes your pain to be worse because it helps us once again in our mind come up with a differential diagnosis for what's actually causing your pain in spinal stenosis when you stand up your spinal canal actually gets narrower and it squeezes your spinal cord, which makes it difficult for people to walk. So pretty commonly, people will say, when I'm walking um, in the grocery store, I have to grab onto the shopping cart, right? So why do you have to grab onto the shopping cart? It's typically not a structural problem, but your body does that because as you bend forward, your spinal canal is actually opening up in size and it takes the pressure off the nerves. As you extend and stand, like if you're waiting online or if you don't have a shopping cart, then it pinches your nerves and it causes you more pain. So specific to spinal stenosis, extension causes pain and bending forward causes you to feel better. 
Now that's exactly the opposite of what a disc herniation would cause. If someone came in and they said, doc, I have pain shooting down my leg, down the back of my leg into my foot, um, and it hurts me a lot when I sit, but when I stand up, I feel better. Then that tells me in my mind that I'm looking for a disc herniation more than spinal stenosis, which is a totally different uh, problem with a totally different solution, okay? So this is a very classic thing that we see with spinal stenosis. So it actually has a, a term, it's called shopping cart sign. Um, so if someone has a positive shopping cart sign, that means that when you go to the grocery store, you grab onto your shopping cart. Um, now sometimes we get a little bit carried away with this and we see every single person in the grocery store on a shopping cart and we think they have a spine problem. It's simply not true. Some people are just tired or lazy, like my daughter. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, it could also be indicative of other problems as well. Um, so some people that grab onto the shopping cart could have bad hip arthritis, right? So they don't want to put weight on their hip. Um, some people can also have um, scoliosis or what we call sagittal imbalance, meaning that um, they're tipped forward, not because their nerves are being pressed, but because the structure of their spine is causing them to tip forward. Um, so it's pretty good at telling us that someone likely has spinal stenosis, but we still need to investigate with um, x-rays and with MRIs. Um, so classically, spinal stenosis is interesting because it doesn't have any physical exam signs that are positive. Meaning when we test you and you come into the office, we're testing for your muscle strength, we're testing for sensation, and we're testing your reflexes. And typically with spinal stenosis, since it's a dynamic problem, meaning it happens only when you walk, not when you sit, these physical exam things are all pretty much normal. So when I examine someone's strength for spinal stenosis, it's normal. Their sensation is usually normal. Um, and their um, only complaint is back pain. Their reflexes are typically normal as well. So it's, it's kind of interesting because physical exam doesn't help that much, but your, your history and your chief complaint really drives us towards this diagnosis. Uh, so once again, the classic presentation is dull or aching back pain. It goes into your um, buttocks, your calves, and your legs, um, and it causes um, a decreased ability to do activities. Um, and foraminal stenosis, if the exit ramp is narrowed and that individual nerve is pressed, then it can cause sciatica going all the way down the leg. And once again, when someone has pain going all the way down the leg, it could be because of a disc herniation or foraminal stenosis. So it's really important to get a really accurate history from people. Um, so why is it important to treat people with spinal stenosis? I'll tell you, one of the biggest problems that we encounter is people that have had spine issues, whether it's stenosis or herniations or, or neck problems, that um, don't come in to see us soon enough, right? So often people will have these problems, they'll go see their primary care doctors, God bless their souls, they're just trying to do whatever is best for their patients, but they tend to put them in this vicious cycle of physical therapy and pain medications. Um, pain medications is a very hot topic right now um, with the whole narcotic um, epidemic that's going on. Um, and uh, I don't think that most people did it with any malice. Uh, they just wanted to help people's pain. So they would give them pain medications and tell them to go to physical therapy because there's this um, idea that surgery is bad. And if you remember, I started this talk off by saying that we always try to avoid surgery if possible, um, but if you need it, you need it. Um, and the problem that we get is we get people coming to see us after they've been on narcotics for 10 years and also after they haven't walked very much for two or three years. So people will come to you and by the time they come to you, they haven't walked very much for two or three years. Their physical capacity to walk is really minimal at this point in time. They're using a cane or a walker or even worse, a wheelchair to get around because the because the decline is pretty drastic. Mm -hmm. And their general health is just way worse than it, than it was. You find that people um, gain weight. Phys physically, they're just totally not what they were. And depression is a really common thing. I mean, depression is a common thing in the elderly population, which doesn't get uh, talked about enough. But when you take away people's independence and their inability to do the things that they want to do as well, so their independence in terms of daily maintenance, like shopping, banking, and all that stuff, and also just things that bring them joy, like going for a walk down the street with their family or going to dinner or, or vacation, that leads to a lot of depression in that population. Uh, and ideally, we like to get to people before all of these things happen, right? Um, I, once again, from a personal anecdote, my, my mom, um, when she had her knee pain and needed a knee replacement, I'd always try to defer her surgery. I'd say, you know, you're not so bad right now. You don't need surgery. You don't need surgery. And I kept putting it off. Um, and this is coming from a guy who has done a lot of knee replacements in his training. 
Um, and uh, I put it off because surgeries aren't 100% successful and complications can happen. Um, but when she came to visit me, she couldn't take my daughter to go get ice cream. We live in downtown Ann Arbor. We couldn't go a block and a half to kill one to go get ice cream. Um, so at that point in time, it was pretty clear that this is significantly affecting her lifestyle. I could tell it was affecting her condition and her mood. So it was the right thing to do to get a knee replacement at that time. And she did, and she did great. And now she's doing fantastic, right? Um, uh, but yeah, so it has a big impact on how people feel about themselves and their general health. So getting them active pretty early is, is an important thing to do. So it's important once again to realize that not everyone with spinal stenosis has pain coming from their spinal stenosis. So not everyone that has radiographs of having narrowing of the spinal canal has pain coming from that. This is important because often people that come in and they see a doctor and say, doc, I can't walk, and they look at their MRI and it shows spinal stenosis, they get, they get a spine surgery, right? And then people don't get better afterwards. Well, if your pain is coming from hip arthritis and not from spinal stenosis, it's not a surprise that surgery in your spine is not going to help you, right? Because your pain is coming from your hip. And vice versa, we see a lot of people that come in with total hip replacements and they're no better. So they get referred over to us and we look at their spine MRI and everything matches spinal stenosis, not hip arthritis. And this is such a big problem that there's actually something called hip spine syndrome. So um, I give a talk yearly um, at our national meeting about this, on how to differentiate um, spine versus hip pathology. And we spent a lot of time, uh, my partner and I, in coming up with an accurate diagnosis. Um, understandably so, when people come to you, they want, their first question is, what can you do to help my pain, right? And my first uh, uh, response to them is, before I can help your pain, I need to know what's causing your pain, right? And people say, well, physical therapy help me. Well, I don't know. It all depends on what the source of your pain is. Will an injection help me? I don't know. It all depends on what's causing your pain, right? There's certain pathologies which are amenable to injections, certain pathologies that are amenable to physical therapy. Um, but if you don't know what's causing someone's symptoms, then you can't prescribe them with treatment, whether it's injections, PT, or surgery. Um, also, people um, think that they just wake up and they develop spinal stenosis. Well, that's not true. Spinal stenosis, once again, is like knee arthritis, right? It's been brewing for a really long time. Um, so if you can imagine your spinal canal as a circle, um, it doesn't just go from a normal circle to 50% volume. It takes time, and over years and years and years, it decreases, right? So then you have to ask yourself, if, if this thing has been going on for years, why did I start experiencing symptoms just a month ago, right? And it's because it's a threshold disease. And what I mean by that is... Um, you can have, let's just say, 70% opening and 30% occlusion of your canal and be just fine. But when it gets to 31%, it pushes you over the top and then you have symptoms. So there's a certain threshold, and once you reach that threshold, that's when you develop symptoms. The tricky part is the threshold is different than everybody. So I've seen some patients, MRIs, that concerned um, primary care doctors have sent to me where they have a complete occlusion of their spinal canal. I mean, that spinal canal has gone to nothing, right? You could barely see the nerves in there. But they're asymptomatic. And then you have some patients who have really little compression of their spinal cord, and they're very symptomatic. So the important point is that spinal stenosis is a threshold disease, um, and everyone's threshold is different. So those are the important uh, takeaways from that. Um, so once again, things that can cause uh, pain are going to be hip arthritis. Um, also, a lot of people have problems with blood flow, right? So as you get older, your, your blood flow to your legs gets worse. So when you're walking and you, if you have pain with walking and you can't do your grocery shopping, how do we know it's not coming from poor circulation in your legs as opposed to spinal stenosis? And there are certain things that we ask. We always say that spinal stenosis is a positional thing, right? Like we pointed out earlier, meaning if you extend, it pinches the nerves and you feel worse, but if you bend forward, you feel better. Um, with uh, vascular claudication, meaning if, if it's because of poor blood flow, any type of activity causes pain regardless of position, right? So if I asked you to walk a block, if you're walking upright, bent forward, whatever, as long as you're walking, your muscles are demanding blood. And if your blood flow is poor, then you're going to have pain. So it's not a positional thing. So this is something that we always ask, and we always do some physical exam science to see whether it's coming from your blood flow or if it's coming from your spine. Once again, all this is really important because the key to successful surgery is establishing a, a proper diagnosis before you operate on someone. That's probably the most important step. Um, so what do we do when patients have spinal stenosis? Well, I talked about non-operative care, right? And I think that should be the hallmark of everyone's first line of treatment, non-operative care. 
The only instance that um, I won't offer non-operative care when patients have lumbar um, stenosis is if their um, neurological status is declining rapidly. Now, this doesn't happen often, but if someone comes in and says, um, my legs are really weak, and I examine them, their legs are really weak, and if they're getting weaker and weaker as the weeks are progressing, then you don't want to wait because you don't want them to develop a permanent neurological problem, right? Uh, and the other is when people say that they're losing control of their bowel and bladder. Um, that's called cauda equina syndrome. The nerves in the spinal canal supply the legs and they make your legs move, but they also supply your bowel and bladder. And the reason why that's important is even if your legs are weak because of nerve compression, if I take the pressure off of them in a reasonable time, you can regain that strength. But when people have loss of bowel and bladder, Typically, if you don't get to it really quickly, within 48 hours, that bowel and bladder function doesn't come back, right? So we're talking about independence and lifestyle a second ago, right? I mean, it's a huge hit to someone's independence and lifestyle if they lose function of their bowel and bladder. So um, these are the only instances where I really won't wait to operate, and I'll say we need to do surgery right away. But otherwise, pretty much everyone goes through a non-operative regimen with us. Um, one of the things I like to use a lot are epidural injections, cortisone shots. Um, they're really good because they provide pain relief for the vast majority of patients, so they're therapeutic. Um, they're also diagnostic. I would mentioned earlier that a lot of people have radiographic signs of spinal stenosis, um, but that's not really the source of their pain, right? So if someone has radiographic signs of spinal stenosis, and if I think it's causing their pain, if I get them an epidural injection to take the inflammation around the nerves, and they feel better, that just confirms to me that this is the reason why they're hurting, right? And so that helps solidify the diagnosis. And once again, the key to treating someone is to have an accurate diagnosis. So this just hammers that in. Also, it's a prognostic test. So the problem with epidural injections are that they don't last for forever, right? Um, and it's typically a law of diminishing returns, where the first one will last for, let's just say, six months. The next one will last for three months. And the one after that will last about a month, right? And you can only have four of them a year. So um, if you are getting at least three months of relief with each injection, go ahead, keep getting them. Um, but if it stops giving you the relief that you want for the duration of time that, that you want, then it's not worthwhile to get more injections. So when I say they're prognostic, they really tell me how much relief you'll get from surgery. So if the injection gives you 100% relief for you know three weeks, that's really important for me to know. A, it tells me diagnostically that the stenosis is the reason why you're hurting. Because if it was your hip arthritis, then an injection in the back wouldn't change your hip arthritis at all. And also, um, prognostically, I know that if you got 100% relief from this shot, the surgery I'm going to do would give you 100% relief as well. So this is why it's important to get an epidural injection. Physical therapy is also important. Physical therapy, you know, is not going to change the structure of your spine. It's not going to remove the pressure from the nerves. Um, but it can help you um, for, in a bunch of ways. So it could temporarily alleviate the pressure on your nerves and help you with your pain. But it could also prepare you for surgery moving forward, right? So the biggest thing that determines how well someone does postoperatively is what their function is preoperatively, right? So if you come in um, with a walker and really deconditioned, it's gonna be really hard for you to recover after surgery. You're likely gonna to go to a rehab facility and your recovery is gonna be way more challenging. But if you come in strong in shape, relatively lean, um, not using a walker or a cane, then there's a really good chance that you're gonna go home after surgery and your outcomes are gonna be way better. So physical therapy is a great way to optimize people preoperatively. Um, exercise and weight reduction are huge. Um, I know there's a cycle of weight gain because of inactivity and depression from having spinal stenosis and not being able to do the things that you want to do. Um, but that weight gain really puts you at a disadvantage, right? So if you're going to have surgery, if you are heavier, it makes your complication rate higher. So I think uh, managing someone's weight is really important. And lifestyle modification. So primarily, stop smoking. It's amazing to me how many people still smoke, even though we have all these warnings out there. And I can understand if it's an older generation because you guys were sold something else. But you know, I see a lot of people who are in their 20s and 30s smoking. And uh, we do a lot of surgery in younger people as well. And smoking um, just leads to a lot of post-operative complications. Um, when we were doing fusions, it doesn't let the bones heal together like we'd want. Increased rate of infections, it just um, makes it a nightmare to operate on people. In fact, a lot of insurance companies won't approve surgeries in patients that are smokers because the outcomes are not as good. And from their perspective, it's going to cost them more money because patients are going to need a, a repeat surgery. 
Um, so all these things are super important. In terms of medications, we're trying to stay away from narcotics, right? Because narcotics will help you with your pain for a short period of time, and then one pill leads to two pills, two pills leads to 10 pills, and then you're not gonna, gonna get any relief from it. Um, uh, from my perspective as a surgeon, it makes it very hard to control your pain post-operatively if you're already taking a lot of narcotics. There's only so much you can take. And if you come in close to the ceiling, we're not gonna be able to control your pain afterwards. So we really try to diminish the amount of pain medications you're taking. So let's just say you do all these things and you find that your pain is no better. Um, then we have a very candid discussion with how much this is bothering you. And I was talking to one of my colleagues today um, and we were talking about the most important thing to lead to a good um, patient outcome with surgery. And it's all about setting expectations, right? So if someone comes in with spinal stenosis and says that they are running a marathon a little bit slower than they want, or they can't play tennis, I'm not gonna offer surgery to them, right? Um, but if someone comes and says they can't do their daily activities, they can't go to the grocery store, they can't go see their friends, then that's someone that needs surgery, right? So um, it's very important for people to assess kind of where they are in that spectrum. We have a five minute visit with you, a 15 minute visit with you, whatever. It's not enough time to assess how your daily life is impacted by this. That's something that I ask you guys to do along with your family members and really be introspective about it and say, hey, is this just a nuisance or is this really affecting the way I'm living my life, right? And so that's a critical point in your guys' journey because if you decide that this is just a nuisance, by all means, don't get anything done. You're not gonna be paralyzed by having this. This is just causing discomfort and it's a lifestyle issue. But if you find that it's critically affecting the way you live your life, then it's worthwhile if the non-operative stuff doesn't work to go ahead and have surgery at that point in time. The surgeries that we do um, vary. So it varies from just taking the pressure off the nerves to taking the pressure off the nerves and doing a fusion. Those are the two main categories that we can, we can uh, divide spine surgery for stenosis in. So um, the traditional technique of um, taking the pressure off the nerves is called the laminectomy. Um, and a laminectomy is essentially where we remove the bone and ligament that's squeezing the spinal canal and expose out the spinal cord to make sure there's no pressure uh, on the nerves. Uh, it's really common. It requires general anesthesia. It's a pretty straightforward case, and most people it takes about 30, 40 minutes per level. In terms of when people go home, most people will go home the day um, after surgery. Um, depending on how debilitated you are before you come to see us, we can kind of predict whether you're going to go home or, or go to rehab. Um, you guys remember I showed you those five lumbar vertebrae? Um, you can have this at multiple levels. So some people need multiple level lumbar laminectomies. And each one that you do adds a little bit more time to surgery and makes your recovery a little bit longer. Uh, but traditionally, most people do really well. If you look at this slide on the bottom, it says the average hospital stay is um, four days and the average OR time is one and a half to four and a half hours. Uh, we're, we're way faster now than, than what this shows. Um, so some people are actually going home the same day. Um, a typical laminectomy involves an incision in the middle of the back and then we retract the muscles to the side, we remove the bone and ligament and take the pressure off the nerves. This is a really gratifying surgery because patients really do really well from it. Um, so the big question is when do you fuse and when do you not fuse, right? Because uh, now when you're fusing someone, you're talking about putting in screws and rods, right? And when then, whenever anyone hears the word fusion, they automatically have this idea that uh, they're not gonna do well from a fusion. And it, it's important to me to, to clarify that not all fusions are the same. When we do fusions, we typically do not do them for back pain. We do them for instability. Right? So what's gonna get you better with spinal stenosis is what I just showed you, the laminectomy, where we take the pressure off the spinal cord. That's what's gonna make you feel good. Um, but sometimes people have instability in their spine. Remember I talked to you guys about how upright x-rays can demonstrate instability? So here's an upright x-ray. So if you look, this is L3, L4, L5, and you can see how these are lining up okay, and there's a step off between L4 and L5. Is that clear to everybody? So if you remove the bone in the back and take the pressure off the nerves, this is just gonna slip even more forward and cause even more pain, right? So what we'll do is we'll do a fusion in that instance, which is putting in screws and rods to stabilize this so the slip doesn't progress. So the important distinction between that and a fusion for back pain is that this fusion is not, gonna, is not aimed at making you feel better. It's aimed at uh, preventing a problem later on. What's getting you better is taking the pressure off the nerves. Uh, when you do this type of decompression and fusion, patients have a really good success rate. So our literature shows that five years, the uh, success rate is 85%, which is a really good number. Um, and that's totally different than when patients have fusions for back pain. 
If you just have an axial back pain, if you don't have spinal stenosis, and if it's just because your discs are slightly degenerated and someone gets a fusion for that, those success rates are somewhere around 60%. So we try not to do um, uh, fusions for back pain because the outcomes are so bad. Um, but um, outcomes for fusions for spinal stenosis are excellent. So I think it's really important to make that distinction because often I'll hear, I heard fusions don't work or my friend or my family member had a fusion and they're doing miserably. 85% um, of times fusions for spinal stenosis really do well. Uh, and we always try to avoid fusions if possible. But if you have this scenario where you have instability or scoliosis, and sometimes, then sometimes you do need to add fusions. So this is exactly what I was trying to mention earlier. Not all fusions are the same. So for spinal stenosis, doing a decompression infusion has an 85% success rate. For someone whose nerves are not compressed at all and who just have a dark degenerated disc, the success rate for fusions are only about 60%. So we really try to avoid doing this surgery and we really try to do this surgery because the outcomes are way better. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Um, so this is what a case would essentially look like when we do an instrumented fusion. We take the pressure off the nerves and then we would um, put in screws and rods to stabilize it. So if you do a fusion with screws and rods, it adds about an hour of um, operative time and it also increases your hospital stay probably about a day. So if you're going to go home post-op day one, now you'll go home post-op day two. Um, so it really doesn't add that much in terms of um, your, your post-operative course, but still more surgery, right? So we always try to avoid doing it if we can. Um, and now we started also doing more minimally invasive surgery. The whole goal of minimally invasive surgery is to accomplish the same goals. Take the pressure off the spinal cord and stabilize the spine if it needs to be stabilized but without making a midline incision. So we always show these pictures because the cuts are always smaller and looks pretty cool. If you fly Delta, you'll see in the back of the magazine from the Laser Spine Institute, there'll be someone on the beach in a, in a bikini with like a small Band-Aid on their back. So it's not for the cosmesis, right, that we make, uh, that we do minimally invasive surgery. It's for the muscle dissection. So when you make a, uh, an incision in the middle of the spine and you retract the muscles, that causes back pain. That procedure just in and of itself. So minimally invasive surgery typically involves not cutting the muscle, but dilating the muscle and going through it. So essentially, instead of making an incision in the middle of the spine, we make these small incisions to the side, which allow us to do the same things, take the pressure off the nerves and put in screws and rods and stabilize it without violating the muscles that attach to the middle of the back. And that's what leads to better patient outcomes. Um, now, minimally invasive surgery could be surgery like this. It could also be another procedure where we make a small midline incision, which doesn't require as much muscle dissection. Uh, but essentially, it's a muscle sparing procedure. Um, something that we're doing a lot now is doing an indirect decompression. So essentially, why do people feel better when they lean forward? I already said it's because the spinal canal opens up, right? But what's exactly happening? Um, so do you remember I talked about the three things that led to spinal stenosis, the disc bulge, the bone growing, and the ligamentum growing. So this, is, this green thing over here is the ligamentum. As you bend forward, the space between this bone and this bone increases, and the ligamentum goes back out, and it opens up the spinal canal. So um, if you can feel better by sitting in a chair or leaning on a shopping cart, that means you're decompressing your spinal canal yourself just by flexing forward. The reason why this is possible is because I said it's a threshold disease, right? So if you had 31% um, canal compromise and you had symptoms at 31% but not 30%, if you can lean forward and just open up your spinal canal a little bit, that can give you good relief of your symptoms, right? So you're already indirectly decompressing yourself. So what we do now is we sometimes do procedures where we put a spacer in where the disc was, increase the disc height, um, and then stabilize it with screws and rods without making a big incision on your back. And uh, this will indirectly decompress your spinal canal. So who's a good candidate for this? Um, anybody who says that when they walk, they have pain, but when they sit and they feel better, essentially, they're a good candidate for it. Sometimes the nerves are so badly compressed that it doesn't matter what position you get in, right? Sometimes some people say, my back hurts me when I sit, my back hurts me when I walk, and there's no one position that causes me any relief. That's because bending forward is not opening up the spinal canal enough to take the pressure off the nerves. Um, and if you can't take the pressure off your nerves by bending forward, then we can't indirectly take it off either. But most people come in soon enough where indirect decompressions do work. So one way we do an indirect decompression is a procedure called a lateral interbody fusion. So it sounds kind of crazy, but we make a, about a one inch incision on your flank on the side. Um, and we um, do a retroperitoneal dissection. So what that means is we take our finger and we sweep all your abdominal contents anteriorly and we take out your disc and we put in a spacer from the side through this mini incision. 
And once again, it's not the cosmetics of putting of using a small incision, but we're not cutting any of your back muscles to do this, right? We're just going in from the side. And patients have a way better recovery with way less pain when we do this procedure. Um, and here's an example of just someone that we operated on last week. Um, you can see that they have a scoliosis, and right over here, their nerves are really badly compressed on the MRI, especially on the right side. So they're having a lot of pain because their foramen, that little exit ramp where the nerves exit the spinal canal, was really narrow over here. So essentially, we made a small incision on the side and put in a spacer and gave this person more disc height, opened up that hole where the nerve was exiting, and their leg pain was gone as soon as they woke up. And you can tell by the staples, this essentially just required a couple of small incisions. We spared all their muscles, and this person went home the next day. So um, this is certainly an option for people. Um, another option for an indirect decompression is something called an anterior lumbar interbody fusion. So essentially taking out the disc, but just going in from the front instead of from the side. I know it sounds crazy to think that we can access your spine from the front, but it's actually really easy to do. And um, it doesn't involve cutting your back muscles once again. So if there's any high level athlete that comes to see us, um, if we want them to return back to sport, we don't want to cut their back muscles because they're not going to be able to play football or baseball or whatever um, pro sport they were playing or collegiate sport they were playing. So we make an attempt not to violate the back muscles and going in from the front is a really good option for them. Um, so if you go in from the front, you can have a pretty clean shot at the disc at L5S1. I just did that today and someone actually went great. And um, this is a, someone I operated on last week. Now you could tell this person has a pretty bad scoliosis, right? Um, but very similar to the other person that we saw, the nerve is being pinched over here as it's coming out and going down uh, this person's left leg. Um, so essentially we went in from the front and put in two cages um, and through little incisions, put in these screws and rods from the back, we spared all the posterior muscles and we opened up their spinal canal centrally and also from the sides. And all this, all this person's leg pain was, was relieved, right? from just this procedure. We didn't need to operate on the whole scoliosis. We didn't need to do a big procedure, just something, uh, something small like this gave him pretty good pain relief. So there are options out there, right? As opposed to big massive spine surgeries. And once again, it's really important to emphasize that the key to a good um, outcome is having a accurate diagnosis, making sure we're operating on the right thing for the right reason, maximizing all non-operative care. And then when you do need surgery, picking the right surgery for the right person. Um, this is my partner, Dr. Leem. He was just operating, and uh, he's here. And we're, we're happy to answer any questions you guys may have. Yeah? No, you won't feel them. They're really deep. So uh, I shouldn't say it. So most people, when everything goes fine, won't, won't feel them. Um, there's a thick layer of muscle and uh, fat and skin covering it, so they're really deep. Um, the problems that we have with instrumentation is that the screws can come loose. And they come loose when someone doesn't fuse. So what we're trying to do when we fuse someone is we're taking two things that are moving and we're trying to fuse them solid. And in order to do that, we put screws and rods in and then we put bone graft in there. And it's always a race between the bone graft melt, mending those two things together versus the screws getting loose. Um, and typically, uh, the bone graft forms a solid fusion, and then those screws and rods really aren't doing anything. Kind of like if you had a broken bone in your wrist and you put a cast on there. Um, the cast is just holding the bone stable enough so the bone can grow across it and make it solid. And that's what essentially the screws and rods are doing. Technically, if you wanted to take the screws and rods out after you're fused, you can because they're not serving any purpose. But that just involves another procedure, so we typically don't do that. The problem is, as you get older, your capacity to fuse becomes less and less, just like your capacity to heal a fracture, right? So if you broke your leg and my 10-year-old daughter broke her leg, her fracture would be healed in two weeks. Yours would probably take six months to completely heal and I'd be in the middle somewhere at about three months. Um, so it's always a race between the hardware getting loose and the, and the fusion taking. Um, there are certain things we can do to help promote fusions. We can use special protein sponges in surgery to help promote it. We can also do a lot of prehab, meaning just like we want you to stop smoking and lose weight before surgery, we can um, send you to someone who works with us to make sure that your bone density is good. And when we put in that screw, we get good purchase on that screw. So all these preoperative things are really important to do to maximize your postoperative outcomes. Yeah. Yeah. 
So um, there are certain things that we're concerned about. If you have um, clips or shrapnel in your eye, that we worry about that because those are really small pieces of metal that can move. But for example, if you had a hip replacement or screws and rods in your back, that doesn't do anything. So you can still get an MRI. The caveat is if you have screws and rods in your back and you get an MRI of that same region, the picture just looks blurry because of metal artifact. Uh, we're getting better at doing MRIs even in that situation, but it's not dangerous for you to have it. And no, you won't set off any metal detectors at the airport either. So yeah, you're fine with that. Yeah, no problem. That's a great question. So the question is, um, what happens if you can do a disc replacement, essentially, right? Um, so we have come up with disc replacements in the lumbar spine and in the cervical spine. Um, the problem in the lumbar spine is it sees so many cycles that it eventually wears out and fails. Um, so that's a problem in the lumbar spine. And the neck, there's not as much load on it. Um, so, lumbar, so, sorry, in the cervical spine, so cervical disc replacements, disc replacements in the neck are done pretty often. Ilias has quite a few of them, um, and they're good substitutes for fusions in the neck. In the lower back, they're not as good um, of a substitute because of all the wear that the material sees. They typically use metal and plastic, just like they do in a total knee replacement, and it just creates so much debris and it wears out. Also, the thing that causes the stenosis is motion. Um, so preserved motion in the setting of stenosis already is just going to exacerbate that. The situation that a disc replacement in the lower back would theoretically be good is if someone doesn't have any pressure on their nerves, but they just have a degenerated disc and it's causing them pain, um, which is totally different than if you have pressure on your nerves. For that, you need to directly take the pressure off the nerves. Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, no, I mean, uh, it's a great question. I mean, uh, it's a huge industry. So lumbar disc replacements, people, everyone wanted to do them. And the main reason the main reason why we want to do lumbar disc replacements is because of uh, another theoretical problem. If you fuse one level, what's gonna happen to the next level, right? It's gonna see more of a load, more of a strain, is that gonna wear out quicker? Um, I, I've kind of evolved my thinking of uh, spine disease, whether it's the neck or the back, um, to think of it as a progressive problem, right? It's a, it's a medical condition that you have. If you had um, your left artery stented and your right artery all of a sudden became uh, clogged, you wouldn't blame it on the left. It's just a progression in a continuum of the disease, right? It's, it's, uh, it's arthrosclerosis leads to that. Same thing. I mean, spine uh, pathology is something that's going to happen in all of us at one point in time. And I don't think that a fusion at one level affects the next level as much as we think. I think it's just a natural progression of the disease. That being said, intraoperatively, we can do certain things to avoid that from happening or diminish the rates of that from happening. These other indirect um, procedures that I spoke about helps diminish rates of adjacent segment degeneration. So there's some things that we can do, uh, but that was the main impetus behind uh, total disc replacements. We also found that in the lumbar spine, when we looked at patients that had disc replacements and we got x-rays on them, the way we um, looked to see if the disc replacement still working is we got flexion extension x-rays to see if it was actually moving. We found that they often auto fused. So even though we put in a mobile bearing surface, it would fuse and become solid anyway. Yeah, ma'am. You mean in general, in the morning, they wake up, they have back pain? Yeah, that's typically just arthritis, um, kind of like um, uh, knees or, or ankles or hips. Um, I have pretty bad arthritis in my ankle. I'm a runner. So when I wake up in the morning, my ankle hurts a lot. Um, essentially, it's because of lack of motion at night. Um, so once you walk around, you lubricate your joint I and mean, you could feel better. That's typically what it is when your pain starts off in the morning and then gets better after five or 10 minutes or so. It, it can be, but it's typically arthritis that causes it. Um, yeah, and that's classic for hips and knees as well. People with knee arthritis or hip arthritis will say that when I first get going, it hurts. And there's actually a term, it's called startup pain. Um, so when I get, get up and get going, it hurts. But when I walk more, I feel better. That's exactly the opposite of spinal stenosis, right? Because in spinal stenosis, patients will say, I can get up, but after 10 or 20 feet, my back and legs start hurting and I need to grab onto a shopping cart. So it's exactly the opposite presentation. And Elias, feel free to jump in and answer any of these questions, okay? Yes? Given that 
Yeah, I don't think it's comorbidities. In fact, the comorbidities lend themselves to minimally invasive surgery, right? So um, uh, obesity um, is one of them. So if you are obese, I essentially would require a bigger incision and working in a deeper hole if you did it with a traditional technique. Uh, one of our partners actually did a study looking at um, uh, MIS versus open traditional techniques on obese population. And they found the complication rates were way less um, with MIS surgery because you're not making a bigger incision and you don't have a big dead space where you can get an infection and blood can pull. Um, I think the bigger question to ask is what conditions are um, uh, lend themselves to be treated minimally invasively, right? I think that's the bigger question. Also, the term minimally invasive, I mean, we're constantly redefining what that term means, right? Um, traditionally, it's just an incision that's smaller than your standard incision. Then we started doing these incisions through tubes on the side. So then it was any paramedian, meaning off the midline incision, was minimally invasive surgery. But now we're realizing that anything that doesn't cause as much soft tissue destruction as minimally invasive surgery. So you can do a small incision in the midline, but if you're not retracting the muscles that much for that long, then that could also be viewed as minimally invasive surgery. So I think alternatives to the traditional open technique definitely exist. They're better for patients with more comorbidities, um, but it's just uh, different indications for them. Um, for surgery in general or for minimally invasive surgery? No, not really. Um, not, not at all, actually. Uh, in fact, for older people, sometimes minimally invasive surgery is better. Um, it also depends on their, their bone stock. So I mentioned prehab a little bit before. So um, I think it's really important to look at your outcomes critically. And when I look back at the surgeries I've done, the ones that I've done great, that's easy to look at and give yourself you know, a pat on the back. But it's more important to look at the ones that didn't do well and think about why they didn't do well. And more often than not, it wasn't anything intraoperative that, that I did, but it was um, uh, that could have prevented it, but it was preoperative stuff that I could have done to prevent it. So making sure their narcotics are down, making sure their nutrition is good, making sure that their bone density is good, are, and making sure that they're, um, they're not obese are, are four things that I can do uh, and I can modify my patients preoperatively to give them the best chance of getting better postoperatively. Yes. Yeah. So, so the question, correct me if I'm uh, if I'm wrong, but is is the stenosis are the stenosis and the arthritis related, um, and they are uh, for the most part. So when we talk about spinal stenosis. That's just narrowing of the spinal canal, and it could happen for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, I showed you um, stenosis with epidural fat in there. It can happen because of a tumor in the spinal canal, but by far the most common reason why people have spinal stenosis is arthritis, and that's called degenerative spinal stenosis. Um, so arthritis comes in different forms. You can have osteoarthritis, which is essentially just wear and tear, and then you can have an inflammatory arthritis, which is like rheumatoid arthritis. Um, so osteoarthritis, unfortunately, there's not too many things that we can do to prevent it. Um, modifiable factors, once again, are smoking and weight loss and activity modification. So if you're an obese smoker that has a factory job working really hard, then you are at a high risk of having it. Um, but if you are someone who doesn't smoke, is not overweight, and you know really doesn't have a, a hard manual labor job, then you have a lower chance. But the number one factor for osteoarthritis is genetics, and that's not alterable, right? Um, and that's different than rheumatoid arthritis. So we see a lot less rheumatoid spine problems now because the treatments for rheumatoid arthritis have gotten so good medically. So patients are going, are going to get medicine early on, so we don't really see that much. So yes, most stenosis goes hand in hand with osteoarthritis. And all you can do is change those modifi modifiable things. You can't change who your parents are, you <laughs> can't change your genetics, but you can certainly change uh, whether you smoke, your weight, and how you kind of live your life and your lifestyle. Foraminal, yeah. Gabapentin, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so um, the question was um, Gabapentin. Um, 
Uh, is it useful and how long can you take it for, right? So um, I, I really like gabapentin a lot. Unlike narcotics, which um, are problematic because you become addicted to them and have a tolerance to them and they're no longer effective, gabapentin is not like that. So there's no tolerance that you develop to gabapentin. It's relatively safe um, and long-term it's safe as well. So as opposed to taking Advil or Motrin every day, which will give you an ulcer, which I take every day, which is not good for me, and narcotics, which um, uh, can cause a dependency and have less effectiveness, gabapentin's great. And you can go up on the doses of gabapentin significantly. Lyrica is another medication similar to gabapentin um, with a lower side effect profile. But I would tell you, if you're getting by just fine with gabapentin, then I wouldn't have surgery. Uh, no. So the progression of the disease is really uh, interesting. It's, it's important to view it as two independent entities, radiographic progression, so what the x-rays and the MRIs look like, and clinical progression, which is how you feel, right? The more important one is how you feel, not what the x-rays and MRIs look like. I don't care if the x-rays and MRIs get worse in five years. As long as you're feeling good, who really cares, right? So I can pretty much guarantee you that all of us are going to have radiographic progression of our spines, um, looking more and more diseased as time goes on. But if we're feeling okay, it's really not a relevant point, right? So it's just how we feel is the most important thing. So if he's clinically feeling fine and, and just taking gabapentin, then it doesn't really matter. This is why routine x-rays and MRIs are not needed, as long as you're feeling okay. No problem. Yes, sir. Yeah, so I think um, it's a fine line, right? You don't want to operate on too early because you may not need surgery. You also don't want to wait too late. Like the example I was giving you when people wait several years and they come to you and now they're not walking or living independently because their preoperative function is going to be really predictive of how well they're going to do after surgery, right? So I would say don't let radiographs be your guide, but let your clinical symptoms be your guide. And when it starts going, I mean, the simplest way to say it um, is when it starts going from a nuisance to affecting your life is when you should have something done for this. Um, when it's just a nuisance, that's fine. And, but when it starts really affecting your quality of life, your ability to work, do your daily activities and interact with others, then it's certainly worthwhile to do something. And now, this only applies, just want to clarify, to the lumbar spine, right? Now, that's different than the neck. If you had something going on in the neck squeezing your spinal cord, that's, that's different. The structure of the spinal cord in the neck is different than the structure of the spinal cord in the lower back. In the lower back, if you have symptoms, and if you've had symptoms for three months, six months, a year, if we operate on you, we can essentially reverse all of that with surgery and get you back to where you were before. We don't want to wait too long because functionally, you'll be um, uh, not in the same condition as you were before surgery. So if I got hurt and I didn't run, I'm a runner. If I didn't run for three months and if I try running again, I won't be as strong. Similarly, if people with spinal stenosis aren't walking for a year, it's really hard to, for them to get back to where they were before. The, the structure of the, of the spinal cord in the neck is a little bit different where um, if the spinal cord in the neck is compressed and is causing clinical problems, um, when you operate on it, People don't always get better, but we're aiming to stop the progression of the disease. So we want to get to it sooner than later in that situation. So in the neck, we want to operate really early. In the lower back, whenever it becomes something that's becoming a nuisance to your lifestyle. The beauty of lumbar spine surgery is you can also fit it in, into your life. I mean, I totally understand that everyone has jobs. If you're an accountant, you're not going to get surgery now because March 15th is coming around. So you're going to wait till after tax season. And if you're a student, you want to wait till summer break. And you know, if you have a, a son getting married, you want to wait till after the wedding. And you have the luxury of that with lumbar stenosis because it's not something that needs to be done right away. No problem. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so it's not a specific scenario. So, okay, gabapentin is ineffective for back pain. Gabapentin is good for nerve-related pain. So anything that mimics sciatica, like pain shooting down the leg or pain in the arm, then gabapentin can potentially be good for that. Um, and there's only one way to know if gabapentin is going to work for you, and that's just by taking it. Um, once again, the side, the side effect profile is really small for gabapentin. One of the biggest side effects is nightmares. So uh, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, so I certainly think it's worthwhile to try gabapentin if you are experiencing uh, nerve pain. If you're experiencing back pain, it's not going to be a useful option for you. Yeah, you can go up a lot. So we usually start people at 300, three times a day, but you can go up to 3,000 milligrams a day. So, yeah, even more, I'm sure. But yeah, you can go up and get a pendant. 
Yeah, yeah, you can. But, you know, I tell you that if it's not working for you at a certain dose, um, then often going up doesn't help. The people that it helps is if it's helping a little bit, then, you, then it, it fades away. Going up helps. But if you're having um, symptoms which are not being touched by gabapentin, then it's probably not going to work for you. And it's really individual and uh, individual basis. Two people with the same pathology can have totally different reactions to the gabapentin. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, if we had a different delivery system where people with that low effect would bankrupt by getting to medical services early and they could approach you with a seeming beginning of symptoms instead of probably to a point where it's terrifically painful, would you be able to give them a, a more extended, comfortable life? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, I have to admit that it's a double-edged sword, right? Um, we're a tertiary referral center. So we have the opportunity to see people who have had surgery elsewhere and then come to us. And I will tell you that some people have surgery too early, right? Um, so some people have problems that are going to get better even if they don't do anything about it and they have surgery. And surgery can sometimes have complications, right? So I see I see a, a, a large number of people that have surgery when I wouldn't have operated them and when Ilias wouldn't have operated them. We would treat them non-operatively, but then, but then they have surgery. Um, but then we see a whole host of people that have waited and waited and waited um, at the usually at the at the request of their primary care doctor, and then they come in where operating on them is just something that is not um, amenable at that point in time, which is really a hard situation because you're essentially telling these people, I know you have a bad problem, but it's too late in the game for me to fix it, and you're going to have to live your life in pain. Um, a, a, a classic scenario for this is patients that have um, deformity surgery. So if someone has scoliosis, for example, um, adult scoliosis is kind of the thing that I like to do a lot of. Um, and if I see someone who's in their 60s or early 70s with adult scoliosis, they can tolerate a bigger procedure way better than someone who's 81 or 82. And the worst case scenario for me is someone who's 80 years old with really bad osteoporosis coming in with a bad deformity who's been in pain for five, 10 years and really can't get around, and me telling him, I know what your problem is, but I can't do anything for you because it's too risky at your age to do it. So in that scenario, having them in the, in the fold earlier would, would be beneficial. That's quite common in this country? Yeah, it is. I mean, it's common in every country. Ilias is uh, Canadian. <laughs> so we talk about healthcare in other countries, and uh, you know, it's, it's common everywhere. In other countries, when they look at patients, they view them not just as individual patients, but they look at how much is the surgery going to cost for each year of your life that you're going to live. So if your expected life expectancy is only 10 years, do they want to invest the $500,000 in the surgery to get you there? Um, as opposed to someone who has a 30-year life expectancy, is it worthwhile investing it? Um, so I mean, not to talk politics, but I think that um, in other countries that have national health care, often patients aren't getting the surgeries that we're getting over here. Um, if you needed a total knee replacement in other countries, you probably wouldn't get it if you were 70, like my mom. They'd probably say you're too late in the game to have surgery. It's not going to be financially worthwhile. It becomes a financial equation at that point in time. Um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. from spinal problems. Does this friend of mine have cold feet? Is there any reason a spinal problem could be linked? Typically not. So when people have cold feet, I remember we talked about blood flow being one reason why people have back and leg pain. So typically it's a blood flow issue which gives people cold feet. Yeah. So once again, I bet you that person, how old is your friend? How old is your friend? Right, so if you have an 80-year-old, and if I get an MRI on your friend who's 80 years old, I guarantee you they're going to have spinal stenosis on their MRI, right, or arthritis or disc bulge or something. That's not what the textbook shows, right? So it's easy to make the incorrect assumption that the cold feet are coming from the spine, operate on the spine, and then surprise your friend's feet are still going to be cold, right? So this is what I was referring to about making a really accurate diagnosis as being the most critical step in taking care of someone. So in that situation, it's likely coming from blood flow, so we'd probably refer them to our vascular doctors to assess their blood flow. Any other questions? Yeah, yes, sir. Do you only 
So uh, we don't do the epidurals. We refer you to our non-operative providers to do them. And um, it's usually a, a combination of cortisone for long-acting anti-inflammatory effects and then also some local, um, like lidocaine, for some immediate numbing effects. Um, and once again, even if you get no relief from it, that's really valuable information for us to know because that means that, okay, maybe it's not coming from the spine and we need to explore other sources for your pain. Yeah, I mean, shots are great, but if they start giving you less than three months of relief, then it's just not worth. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's why I just don't see the point of going for any more at that point in time. If you're only getting two days of relief, um, it'd be great if you were getting two months or three months of relief, but if you're getting two days, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I mean, I was talking about injections being. Um, diagnostic, uh, therapeutic, and prognostic, right? So in the prognostic aspect of it, if you're getting good relief even for two days, that means that you're probably going to do really well if you get surgery for your condition. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I just wanted to come up and uh, introduce myself. So I'm uh, Dr. Leem, uh, Dr. Patel's partner here. And I want to thank all of you for coming out today uh, in the weather. And uh, uh, the only thing I really wanted to mention, I know uh, he covered everything really thoroughly here, is that um, really back pain, uh, leg pain, spinal stenosis, spinal problems are really debilitating. And all of you, you know, you know, you have friends, family, yourself um, that have people with back issues and live like that with, for years and years. Um, you know, spine surgery, um, you know, obviously most conditions don't need surgery, but if it comes down to that, spine surgery has really come a long way. Um, you know, many of us have heard of, you know, horror stories of people who had spinal fusions and are now bedridden and not walking or whatever it is. Um, and I would say that really, um, you know, I think 20, 30 years ago, that was, that was really the case, but uh, spine surgery has come a long way, not only in terms of technology, but also in the way that uh, decisions are made and the way that data and evidence uh, is being incorporated. Uh, you know, there's a whole movement of evidence-based medicine, and that's also come through in, in, in surgery um, and really looking at which patients do better uh, with which operations, which conditions, um, and, we're, and in the minimally, uh, sorry, in, in the smallest possible uh, surgical impact. Um, and that's really what we try to focus on um, and, you know, uh, the, selecting the right patient with the right pathology and, and performing the right surgical procedure. And I think in that patient, um, by and far, uh, the vast majority of patients do very well. Um, and we, we all have patients whose lives have been significantly changed. You know, every day we see people that are, you know, have lived for years and years with pain and, and now um, are, are have an opportunity at, you know, I wouldn't say a pain-free life, but at least a significantly improved life. Um, and so I think that uh, really we owe it to ourselves and our family members or friends to, to at least look into, uh, look into it. So thank you. Is 
Yeah, so, so, so that's a great, a great question. Um, I would say that uh, as long as the surgeon is spine fellowship trained, um, really, you know, uh, you know, I think that uh, more important than whether they're a neurosurgeon or an orthopedic surgeon, you want to look at somebody, you want to find somebody who's spine fellowship trained. And I would say really it's important to, to that they work at a reputable center. Um, you know, again, more than orthopedic or neuro, like we see you know, working where we are, um, uh, surgeries and patients that had surgeries all over the place, you know, and it really doesn't matter if it was ortho or neuro, um, you know, it's, it's more important again, that they perform the right operation in the right way. Uh, we work with our neurosurgery colleagues all the time. Um, so neurosurgery spine colleagues, um, and both from the orthopedic side and the neurosurgery side, um, you know, I would say that, uh, uh for the most part, we're fairly similar. Sometimes the surgeries are exceptionally complicated. Um, we'll both be involved in the surgeries together. Um, so you'll have two attending physicians, which are what we're called, and we'll just make sure everything's in there. But we're, yeah. <laughs> so you'll have, you'll have both of us in there if it's a complicated case. But um, we will always be there. We'll always be um, doing the surgery. And the, the learning is control. We're not going to ruin someone else from doing the surgery. And then, I don't know. So your, your sacroiliac joint is the joint that connects your spine to your pelvis. And um, it's funny because we never really viewed the sacroiliac joint as a pain generator. And the reason why we never did is because traditionally to fuse it would involve a big surgical procedure where the approach hurt more than the problem. Uh, now we have these minimally invasive techniques where we can make an incision about an inch long and we can do a sacroiliac fusion through a one inch incision. Uh, patients go home the same day and we use a robot to do the surgery. So it's really straightforward for us to do. It takes about um, 15 minutes of operative time and patients go home the same day. So it's a really a straightforward procedure. Um, the key to a successful sacroiliac fusion is the same as the key to any other surgery, making an accurate diagnosis, right? So making sure that it's someone's sacroiliac joint that's hurting. Because I could do a beautiful technical procedure in someone in 15 minutes, but if that's not the reason why they're hurting, they're not going to feel any better, right? So uh, the key is to have an accurate diagnosis. And the way we diagnose sacroiliac joint pathology is with an injection. So you get a cortisone and a lidocaine shot in your sacroiliac joint. If it takes away your pain, even for a short period of time, that's a diagnostic test. And then we go ahead and we do the surgery. All the time. Yeah, so... 
So often patients will have multiple problems, right? You can have lumbar spine pathology and sacroiliac pathology. You can have lumbar spine pathology and hip arthritis and knee arthritis. You can have a whole bunch of things, right? It's not like when you get older, one thing goes and everything else stays normal. Usually everything deteriorates at some, some level. So the question is, which one of those things is causing most of your disability, right? So let's just say you have lumbar stenosis and sacroiliac problems. If you get a sacroiliac injection and you say, Doc, I feel 80% better, uh, if I could take away 80% of your pain with one procedure, that's what I'll do. If the residual 20% bothers you later on, we can deal with it. But if you get the sacred iliac shot and you say, Doc, I only feel 10% better, then it's not worth addressing that. It's worth addressing the other problem, which is the stenosis. So you got to see which one of those things is a bigger pain generator and attack that first. Yes, ma'am? I had a question about um, quality of life. Mm -hmm. You'd be one of the healthier people we operate on if that's all you had. So um, absolutely. Um, unfortunately, people that are 20 years old don't have spine problems for the most part, right? Um, it's pretty rare. So most of the people we operate on are older. And another reason why people come to Michigan is we have great internal medicine doctors. We have great ICUs so we can handle p patients with medical problems. Now, it all depends on what the surgery is going to be, right? So if someone has heart disease and has had a bypass procedure done, I'm still okay as long as we get medical clearances doing a lumbar stenosis procedure on them. But I'm not going to do a procedure where I'm putting in 30 screws, two rods, and it's going to take me 12 hours on that patient, right? So it all depends on what procedure that patient needs and how many medical problems they have. But pretty much everyone we operate on has some medical problems. We work really closely with the primary care doctors and the cardiologists to get them cleared. And once again, we have someone working in our uh, department who just deals with bone health. So essentially, every single patient that we're doing surgery on is going, is going to go see them, make sure that they're optimized, uh, and their bone is as strong as it's going to be for surgery. And I think the key is optimized, right? Because you'll never be as healthy as you are when you're 20. Your bones will never be as good. <laughs> sorry, sorry to break that news. But, um, but we can make you as good as you can be given what, where you are right now. Um, so we try to optimize everyone before surgery. And then I think a really candid discussion is the most important thing. Um, so just discussing what the risks and the benefits are of undergoing the procedure and what you can expect functionally afterwards. I think setting expectations and having, having this discussion before surgery is the most important step. Yes, ma'am? Yeah. So I can answer part of that question. Um, so there are two things that you can do when you're operating on patients with osteoporosis. You can maximize their bone density preoperatively, and then you can do different things intraoperatively to help them out, right? So on the preoperative front, um, there are many medications, and it depends on what the source of your osteoporosis is and how bad your osteoporosis is. Um, so this is why you, you need to speak to a specialist like what we have in our department who can look at your bone density test, look at all the medications you're on. Some people are on chronic steroids causing the osteoporosis. Some people are way off the, the score. My mom, for example, had a T-score of minus 4, which is really, really bad. Uh, so she took Prolia injections for a year before she had her knee replacement done. Um, if it's not so bad, then you don't need to have extensive medication for that long. You don't need to delay your surgery. So I think the question for which medication do you need um, is better asked towards a specialist like who we have. Intraoperatively, once I'm told that you're optimized, I still recognize that, once again, your bone is not going to be what it was for someone who is 20 years old. 
Um, keeping that in mind, we have certain surgical techniques that we use to increase the likelihood of success. So, for example, yesterday, I think it was yesterday, I operated on someone with really bad osteoporosis who had surgery elsewhere and who, who had failed. Um, so one of the things that we did to ensure that her screws would not pull out is we use something called fenestrated screws. So we put in the screws and they have little holes in the ends of them and we inject cement through the screws and it forms a halo of cement around the screws to give it extra support and osteoporotic bone. So that's one of the intraoperative things that we do. Um, we also use other techniques like putting in something called cortical screws, which are different than the traditional screws that we use. When people have osteoporosis, it's not as if their entire vertebra becomes osteoporotic. There's a certain section of their vertebra, which even if you look in osteoporotic people, still maintains its bone density. And that's what these screws kind of aim for, and that's what they bite into. So these cortical screws are another option in patients with osteoporosis. Um, we also are starting to use screws that don't require tapping. So if you basically have to drill a pilot hole before you put in your screw, that makes it more likely for the screws to pull out. So if you just put in the screw without drilling the pilot hole with a special type of screw, um, then that increases the likelihood that the screw is not going to pull out. Um, so these are all intraoperative things that we do. Postoperatively, sometimes we give people braces uh, as well to help um, basically belt and suspender the system. And I hate to say it, but even though we do all these things, preoperative, intraop, and postop, sometimes patients with osteoporosis do have screws that fail and fusions that don't take. And we deal with those complications as they happen. But this is why it's really important to maximize you preoperatively and have discussions on what may happen after surgery, even if we do all the things appropriately. Any further questions? All right, guys, drive safe. Thank you guys very much for braving the weather and coming here. We really appreciate it. Thanks a lot.